The Nara National Research Institute for Cultural Properties have engaged in the excavation survey of Japanese ancient capitals for more than 60 years. This lecture explains standard methods and precautions to organize, analyze, and store artifacts, mainly pottery and roof tiles, excavated in the Nara capital site. Please keep in mind that special artifacts, such as wooden and metal artifacts, which are fragile or not appropriate for washing with water, require different treatment. Excavated artifacts are carried into the laboratory with a card describing when and where they were excavated. This is crucial information to determine the academic value of each object. Without this information, there is no evidence to examine the date and nature of the archaeological site concerned, resulting in the loss of reliability in the excavation survey, as well as the value of artifacts. Therefore, you should always make sure to put the artifact and its card together. Excavated pottery and roof tiles are soaked in water to loosen the clay stuck to their surface then washed with a brush. In Japan, we use the water-resistant paper called Yupo paper as a card to record the artifact's information. A benefit of using Yupo is that we can keep the card in water together with the artifacts, so that we do not have to worry about the switching or the loss of the cards. When filling in the card, the use of black ink is recommended to avoid colour fading. When you use adhesive tapes on the boxes, tapes with colours like red similarly deteriorate easily. At the excavation site, the artefacts are sorted out into several categories, such as relatively stable pottery and stone tools, fragile wooden artefacts, and metal objects which should avoid water. Since the method of cleaning is different depending on the type of artefacts, they should be sorted out again into smaller categories before washing. Different soil conditions at each site needs different ways of cleaning the artefacts. Fine-grained clay tends to stick to artefacts. The artefacts may be damaged by rubbing hard with a brush, so you should soak them in hot water of between 40 to 50 degrees Celsius for some time to loosen the clay stuck on their surface. Relatively tough bristle brushes may be used for solid items. However, soft brushes are used in some cases, since pottery may have food residue or a fragile glaze remaining on the surface. Used toothbrushes can also work. Some artefacts may have a decoration of gold leaf or a remnant paint for construction materials. Therefore, you should be careful when cleaning. After cleaning, the artefacts are dried well. If they are dried insufficiently and put into plastic bags, they may result in problems with the growth of mould. There are cases where fragile pottery buried in acidic soil for a long period of time breaks into pieces during this drying process. In the case of such pottery, it is recommended to leave an observation note or take a photograph of its surface condition. In our research institute, such pottery is impregnated with a water-soluble acrylic resin, binder 17 before drying in some cases. Resin impregnation works for retaining the shape of pottery to some extent. However, the treatment with water-soluble acrylic resin is irreversible and disturbs the scientific analysis of substances attached to the surface. Careful consideration is necessary for such treatment. In the process of cleaning, Unique artefacts such as pottery with letters written on the surface, or those requiring scientific analysis, uniquely shaped pottery, and significant objects for the interpretation of the site 
are classified separately and registered in a database. To compile the report of an excavation survey, the artefacts should be classified and organized efficiently. Information on the artefacts, including their type, the excavated layer, and site code is essential to understanding the archaeological site. For instance, when the roof tiles of the same design are excavated from pillar hole 1 and 2, these two pillar holes probably belong to the same building. If pottery sherds excavated from a well and a ditch fit each other, the site may be the remains of water facilities where water from the ditch flowed into the well. Therefore, an attentive perspective is important in collecting the data as evidence, connecting archaeological features or layers when you organize the excavated artifacts. Information on the key details of excavation are marked on each piece of pottery, but not to impair its value as evidence. It should be written on the less apparent side when the pottery is restored and exhibited in a museum. To be more concrete, the bottom or inside of the vessel is preferable. Write the necessary information in the smallest possible letters with Sumi ink for bright coloured sherds and white acrylic paint for dark coloured sherds. For the protection of the letters marked on the fragile pottery surface, apply a thermoplastic resin coating. When a large number of artefacts are excavated at one place, the same contents have to be written on the pottery shards repeatedly. In such a case, we sometimes use an inkjet printer like the one on this slide. This was originally developed for printing the date of production on the packages of food and drink. After being marked with the excavation information, the shards are joined for the restoration of pottery. This process requires a lot of patience, but it tells you the production method or materials used. For example, pottery tends to break along a joint surface. The way of joining at the neck of jars shows different characteristics according to the historical period, so the observation of relevant parts may help in dating the pottery. For bonding, we use a cellulose adhesive. It is comparatively less expensive, dries quickly, and is easy to remove since it is soluble in organic solvent. Acetone is used for the removal of adhesive. After applying the bonding agent, adhesive tape is used for the temporary fixation when necessary. Tapes with low adhesiveness should be used for that purpose. For artifacts with a fragile surface condition, the use of adhesive tape may damage the glaze and other elements. In such cases, clothes pins are used effectively. Put a slip of cardboard on both sides of the joint pottery shards and hold them with a clothes pin over the cardboard. The next part starts with the explanation of the process to prepare the data for publication in the excavation survey report. This is the procedure to prepare the artifacts data for publication in the excavation survey report. After gathering the information of the excavated artifacts from sites and remains, Typical or notable artefacts are selected for measured drawings and photography. The selection of artefacts needs careful consideration, since it constitutes the basis for later research and investigation. As for the artefacts that were not selected for their details, their total volume should be reported in terms of number of containers or others. It may also be useful to report the total weight of artefacts by grid or the percentage of each type. Try to provide the whole aspect in an objective manner, using the text and numerical data effectively. 
prepare measured drawings of the artefacts selected for the report. There are various methods of measured drawing of archaeological artefacts in the world. The measured drawings in Japan is just like a design drawing, from which you can know the precise size and even a production method of the artefact. Japanese measured drawings have two types, horizontal projection and vertical projection. A flat artefact, such as a stone tool or a metal artefact, is placed onto a section paper, also called graph paper, to draw a horizontal projection from above. Based on that horizontal projection, a cross-section plan is also made by measuring at arbitrary points. As for a rotating or round body, such as pottery, a drawing of a vertical projection from the side is made, including a cross-section measured on a surface passing on a centre point and a frontal elevation. As a rule, the inside of the pottery appears on the right, while the outside is on the left. In this session, the method of measured drawings of a rotating body is explained in detail. The important step for the drawing of a rotating body is to obtain its centre point. Even with a piece of pottery, if there is an arc remaining, you can obtain the diameter by using a compass. In this video, a simple method using tracing paper is introduced. First, trace the arc of pottery on a sheet of tracing paper. Then, fold the paper in half so that both ends of the arc overlap. Fold the paper again in the same way. The marked point is the centre of the pottery vessel, and you can obtain the radius. To use this method, you need to have one-sixth of an arc at the least. When the remaining arc is less than one-sixth, it results in a larger error. In the case of deformed pottery, use a less deformed part or measure a few different points to take an average. This is another handier method to obtain the radius of a rotating body. Place the pottery shard on a sheet of polar grid, searching for the position that fits to its curve. You can make a polar grid sheet by yourself with a compass and a ruler. With the radius obtained, draw an arc. Along the arc, put the pottery in a horizontal position. Make a vertical reference line next to the pottery using a pair of triangular rulers. For this purpose, triangles with grid lines are better. As for the ruler for measurement, it is preferable that the edge of the ruler starts at zero. These are the rulers starting at zero used for measured drawing. You can make one easily by cutting a steel measuring tape that is frequently used at excavation sites. Set the pottery and the triangles for a vertical reference line and start the measurement. Measure the height from the top of the work table, A, and the distance from the reference line to the pottery surface, B, and mark each measurement point on the drawing paper. In the measurement, make sure to keep the ruler in a horizontal position and your eye level in line with the ruler's height. This shows how to set two triangle rulers for a vertical reference line in preparation for the measured drawing. Before you start measuring, observe the artifact carefully to examine which part is to be drawn and what kind of expression to be used. The measured drawing should provide the information on production and decoration techniques, as well as the shape of the artifact. 
Place the artifact horizontally on the desk. Use clay or a kneaded eraser to stabilize the rim of the artifact in a horizontal position. You should also set the artifact in the position that the cross section of the artifact plan for the drawing passes through the center of a rotating body and a vertical line made with triangle rulers. Measure with a cut ruler starting at zero. A ruler must be put in a horizontal position at all times. Mark the measurement points onto the paper and connect the points to draw the outline of the artifact. This is a tool named Mako, a contour gauge made of bamboo slips and a wooden frame. It was originally developed by a Japanese archaeologist. Some experts make it by themselves. When you use Mako, make it perpendicularly to the surface of the artifact towards the center axis of the artifact. Measure the thickness of pottery with calipers or dividers. When you know the thickness, you can draw the cross section. A graduated caliper converts the thickness into numerals. With this type of caliper, you cannot read the subtle differences of less than one millimeter, but it is still useful for the measurement of the thickness of pottery in complete shapes, with which there is no broken part to measure directly. While the caliper may contain a slight error due to the quantification, dividers are more precise since they can directly transfer the distance between two points on the artifacts to the drawing. The trace of surface finishing or decoration of pottery is transferred to the drawing by using these dividers. At this point, you have to be careful in the projection of distance between two points. The distance between two points measured by dividers in three dimensions, A in the figure, is projected shorter in the two-dimensional drawing, A dash in the figure. For the projection of the distance between two horizontally positioned points, you can simply correct the distance with a top view drawing. To save you trouble drawing a top view, you can also refer to the circular arc. For the projection of the distance between two points in a vertical positional relation, use a cross-section drawing. Measure the artifact from the edge of a rim towards the center, B in the figure, and transfer it to the side of the section drawing, B in the figure. Then, it is projected onto the measured point, B dash in the figure. In this way, you can draw the precisely projected surface information of the artifacts with dividers, combining the top view or section drawing cleverly. The complete measured drawings are kept with the descriptions of the object and the information of reports in which the drawing is used it is recommended to use acid-free papers for long-term preservation. It is desirable to scan the drawings and construct a database to manage the digital data. Database construction is imperative for an institution like ours, which has tens of thousands of drawings to manage. Measured drawings are traced for the publication with the aid of software CAD software for industrial use or design software such as Adobe Illustrator is useful. Recently, other inexpensive web design software is available as well. This kind of image rendering is called vector data. There are different file formats depending on the software used, and it is recommended to convert and save them as PDF for future use and compatibility. Rubbing is a method to express the complex and uneven surface of the artifact. There are wet and dry rubbings, and it is better to use dry rubbing without water for the metal artifacts. The wet ink rubbing method using water is introduced here. As shown on the left, 
adding an ink rubbing to a measured drawing may increase the efficiency in drawing. The figure on the right is a drawing of porcelain with complex patterns. A photograph of the outer surface is added to the measured drawing. When you use a photograph in this way, the photograph should be taken from a distant position with a telephoto lens to reduce the effect of lens distortion. After the completion of measured drawings, some artifacts are restored for photography or exhibitions. Missing parts of joined pottery are filled with plaster or other fillers. In Japan, we often use a quick hardening cementitious material called Q-Tex. It is an industrial material used for waterproofing and the repair of roofs. It is ready to use only by mixing with water and hardens quickly. After it hardens, you can easily shave it to modify the shape. Its lighter weight compared to plaster is advantageous for restoring large artifacts. Most artifacts are excavated in the condition with some missing parts. Restoration of such artifacts by filling those parts helps people in general understand the original appearance of the artifacts. Plaster was widely used for restoration in the past, but these days it is common to use cementitious materials. For the restoration of Japanese archaeological artifacts, plaster or cementitious material, cutex, are mainly used. These materials are relatively inexpensive and suitable for the restoration of artifacts, such as pottery. In cases requiring a high level of precision, the restoration is consigned to professionals who use resin or a 3D printer. This shows a comparison between plaster and cutex. They are also different in the texture of finishing. Cutex has a little rough surface finishing that fits for unglazed pottery and roof tiles. On the other hand, the smooth surface finishing of plaster is suitable for the restoration of porcelain. You should choose the materials for restoration with a proper understanding of their features. For restoration, knives for arts and crafts are used. Sandpaper is also used for finishing. The restored part of the pottery is coloured. The colouring is arranged to attain a finish so that you can distinguish the original pottery fragments from the restored portions with close observation, but they will appear quite similar at a distance. When you colour the filled part identically with the original, it may cause misunderstanding for visitors. Therefore, in Japan we differentiate the colour of the restored part from the original. In the next part, I will explain the system for the storage and registration of artefacts. Measured, restored, or photographed artifacts are stored in box containers with the reference information so that they can be compared with the corresponding measured drawings and photographs. As the bonded pieces may be detached later, it is recommended to keep each joint pottery in a bag separately for the prevention of mixture of sherds. To efficiently locate the artifacts in storage, the management number is attached to each box container. The management number may be written directly on the container in case the label is lost during long-term storage. When a fire breaks out in the storage, these plastic containers melt and get fused in some cases. In Japan, there actually was such a case. 
Therefore, the use of wooden storage containers is recommended for facilities not equipped with a fire alarm system or automatic fire extinguisher. Each box container has the description of information on the excavation point, type of artifacts, official report number, measured drawing number, etc. The institutions keeping the artifacts are responsible for applying to inquiries on their materials from students and researchers from other institutions. It is required to establish a system to smoothly and easily search the artifacts cited in the official reports. Shelves are joined by metal fittings or fixed to the wall for the prevention of collapse by an earthquake. The artifacts are stored in a box container. The data on the excavation site and corresponding archaeological features is put into the plastic bag together with the artifacts. The contents of each bag storing artifacts are listed on the card. For excavated artifacts, it includes the information of the excavation area, soil layer, material, vessel shape, and era. The completed cards are filed in chronological order of the archaeological surveys and stored for reference. Excavated artifacts never decrease in volume. As the survey progresses, you have increasing numbers of artifacts to store. Therefore, for efficient storage, it is recommended to pack the artifacts compactly to the extent that they are not damaged. Once isolated from information, such as the excavated point, the artifact loses its archaeological value. For the future reference, try to store the artifacts in an orderly manner. Please note that some types of materials, such as red oil-based ink and cellophane adhesive tape, are not suitable for long-term storage, since they tend to deteriorate easily. Then, let us focus on the management and storage of special artefacts. Rare artefacts and unique artefacts, which cannot be identified in their use for example, are classified as special artefacts. Researchers investigate such artefacts to examine the nature of the site where they were excavated, as well as the artefacts themselves. Typical special artefacts are pottery with sumi ink writings, ink stones, ritual utensils, glazed ceramics, ceramics imported from China and Korea, etc. In the storage area, the special artefacts, researchers check the pieces, exchange opinions about unidentified artefacts, and carry out special observation tasks. For the registration, characteristics of the artefact are recorded on a card. The card is attached to the artefact. For each survey, the excavated artefacts classified as special artefacts are assigned with a number starting from 1, and each number is recorded in a notebook together with the information of the artefact. Each artefact is photographed for the special artefact database. Overall image and close-ups of unique features should be captured. The photographs are numbered and registered. For processing such as exposure adjustment, we use Adobe Photoshop software. Each excavated artifact is registered in the database with the photographs and written descriptions of its characteristics. We use FileMaker Pro as the database software. The information entered in the database is cross-checked against the card describing the characteristics of the artifact. After confirmation, a registration card is prepared and printed. This registration card with a photograph and serial number is also attached to the artifact. 
the slide shows a set of a special artifact and cards. These are 1. Label listing the survey number, excavation location, soil layer, and date. 2. Information card describing the characteristics of the artifact. And 3. Registration card. They should always be kept with the artifact. We create a backup file including the photographic data and the registered information. Backup data of databases in each laboratory of our institute is automatically stored in another department about 40 kilometers away from the institute every night. It is important to keep the backup data in a remote place in preparation for an earthquake or other disasters. This is storage for particularly important artifacts among the special artifacts. The lockers are stabilized to resist earthquakes. Each box is labeled with a management number, name of excavation site, and associated archaeological features, excavation layer and drawing number. A list of the artifacts, including their registration number and photograph, is kept in the box with the artifacts. It is useful to know the contents of a box even when an artifact is temporarily taken out from the storage. This concludes my lecture. I hope you will utilize what you have learned from this lecture.